Well, good morning. How about them Rangers? Yeah. All right, who, who stayed up and watched the whole game? Wow, wow. Yeah, I went to bed at the end of the second inning, and my wife's sitting there, she goes, where are you going? I said, I, I got to get up early. I, I said, I can't, I can't. and I, plus, I don't want to do this to myself. I was hopeful, but I had a little bit of doubt. And I laid in bed virtually all night going, should I look? No, no, it just ruined my night. And then I finally got up this morning and saw that they had won, and it was, man, that's great. It's been a long time. We won't talk about the Cowboys, um, but I'm happy we're going to the World Series. If you got your Bibles, open them up, and we're going to be in chapter 24, and we're, we're in a great section of the book. We're going to be talking about uh, the tabernacle, and everything goes with the tabernacle. Now, as, as has been the case with the last few weeks, um, we're in these sections where we're covering a lot of territory. I had a guy come up yesterday at church, and he goes, man, the devotionary readings are getting longer and longer. And I'm like, I, I know. And here's what you need to know. I read through them every week, just like you do, or at least I hope you do, um, because I want to go back and see what I wrote back in January. Um, I, I know it's a lot of reading, but, but it's, it's worth it. And we're at another point where we're not going to get into all the details of the tabernacle. And, and I know some of you guys are going to want me to cover every picture of Christ that's there and we're not going to do it. Again, if you want to read the devotionary, I go into greater detail. But I also don't want to do it because I want to keep looking at this book the way it was written for the original audience. And th they didn't see pictures of Christ. They didn't see the atonement on the cross. They didn't see all the things we see. And we're going to look a little bit at that. But what they saw was a tabernacle, the design for a tabernacle. And so I want to look at this the way they would have looked at it. What did they hear? What did they see? What was God trying to show them about himself? So that's the way we're going to approach it. And just so you know, in uh, the spring, when we come back in January, we're going to do the book of Hebrews. We're going to go to the New Testament, but we're going to do Hebrews because Hebrews shines a light back on the book of Exodus. And it explains so much of what we see in this book that doesn't make sense to us and most certainly didn't make sense to the Israelites. So that's what we're going to do in the spring. But today, we're going to take a look at these chapters and see what was God doing in the giving of the tabernacle. So let me pray for us, and we'll jump into it. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain, and I pray, Father, that you would be with us as we meet. We know you're here. You've told us that wherever we gather together, you come and you meet in our midst, and you dwell among us. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, Lord, that you, you chose to come and dwell among the people of Israel. They didn't deserve it, hadn't done anything to earn it, but you chose to come and be with them and make your home among them. And you've done the same thing in our lives. And Father, we take it so for granted. So would you open our eyes and help us to see that truth, that reality, and, and what it should mean in our lives that you have taken up residence in us, among us, and we have access to you 24-7, 365 days a year. So, Father, we give you this time, and we pray that you would speak to us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to do is I want to read uh, the opening part of chapter 24 to get, get the context. Here's what it says. Then he said to Moses, God says to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. So we're at this part where God has them at Mount Sinai, and he's appeared on Mount Sinai, and he appears in smoke and fire and thunder and lightning, and the people see it, and it scares them, and we're going to look at that in a little more detail in a second, but God is there. It's, it's real obvious that God's there. They don't really see God, but they see the, the image of God in the form of smoke, fire, thunder, lightning, cloud, and it's, it's scary. It's a theophany. But God's going to call up Moses and Aaron and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, seven of the elders of Israel. Probably these men were some of the ones who had been chosen to help him judge the people of Israel based on the input from Jethro, his father-in-law. And it says in verse 2, Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Now, this is setting up what's about to happen because God has appeared. He's there. He's on the top of Mount Sinai in the form of this cloud. It's really a storm cloud. And 
God is inviting Moses and Aaron and Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders to come up, but only one guy gets to what, what worship God. So it tells us that there's um, a little bit of distance. Not everybody gets to come into God's presence. You can see him, he's there, but you can't come in and be with him. And that's what's going to be important about the tabernacle because things are beginning to change. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. He, he disseminates to them everything that they've heard, everything that he's heard from God. He lets them know. He's communicating it to them. And it says, all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We've seen this before, right? They, they've made that statement before. So they do it again. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, everything he's heard from God, the covenant, the commandments, everything he's heard, he's written it down. And then he rose early in the morning and he's going to go up to the mountain and he's going to meet with God. But what do they say? They say, we will do whatever God says we will do. Now, this is the second time they've done this. And there's going to be a third time coming very shortly. So the people are eager, they're enthusiastic. But as I said last week, sometimes our enthusiasm Enthusiasm is based on ignorance. We, we don't really understand. The first time they said, we will do, they didn't know fully what God was expecting of them because he hadn't yet given his commandments. It was prior to that happening. So they're like, yeah, we're all over this. We, we want to be his treasured possession. We, we want to be a royal priesthood and a, and a holy nation. So yeah, we'll do that. We want God to be with us. We want God to continue to bless us. But they didn't yet have the law. They didn't know what was coming. So the first time, they didn't have all the details. They signed the contract without reading the small print. But now they've gotten the small print. They've heard the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, those ten statements, four of which are directed at their relationship with God, and six that are directed at their relationship with one another. They now knew that. They also had the Book of the Covenant. All those other laws that we didn't look at last week, and it's the vast majority of those middle chapters, are what is called the Book of the Covenant. The, all the laws, the 613 laws that they had to keep as part of the covenant agreement. And so they have that now. There's, there's no question about what God expects of them. He's also said, and I'm going to give you the land. What was the whole reason he brought them out of Egypt? So they could go to the land. That's ultimately where they're going. So he's given them his Ten Commandments, he's given in the Book of the Covenant, the promise of the land, and I'm going to be with you, which should have been the greatest assurance they ever had, because in order for them to get from Sinai to the promised land, they needed God to be with them. But I don't think they quite yet understand how important that relationship is. Uh, they, they don't yet understand how much they really need God. And in a way, I think they're probably a little bit cocky because they've just gotten out of what? A battle. Their very first battle, and how did that go? Great. They defeated the Amalekites, right? With the help of Joshua's leadership, Moses' intercession, and his two helpers who helped him keep his arms up so that God would bring victory. But they're a little bit cocky because, man, look what we just did. We just had a, a great victory. And do we really need God? Well, what's interesting is, is that God is going to give them someone to help lead them. Even though he says, I will be with you, even though he's appeared to them in the form of a cloud by um, day or uh, night or day by, and a fire by night, he is giving them someone. Here's what it says in chapter 23. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I prepared you. What place? Canaan. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. This is a fascinating passage, and there's a lot of debate about who it's talking about. Who is this angel that God promises to send with him? Um, there are those who believe it's a reference to Moses. There are others who say, no, 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 it's a reference to Joshua. Uh, there are others who say it's a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. There's, there's all kinds of opinions about who this individual is. Who's this angel? It's not the first time this angel has shown up. And he's really kind of a guardian angel, a guardian angel who goes before them and cares for them, guides them and leads them. All the way back in Exodus 14, it says, then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them 
And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. This is all the way back to that Red Sea experience when they found themselves led by God in the circuitous route. They end up at the Red Sea. They can't get across it. The army of Israel's, or Egypt is bearing down on them. And God has sent this angel, this angel of God who is going before them. And he comes between them and the army of Egypt. And he holds them off until they have time to get across the Red Sea. So we've seen this angel of God before. But again, who is he? Well, the word in Hebrew is Magdal, and it means, or Malak, I mean, and it means messenger. It can be an angel. It can be some kind of divine being. It can also be just a messenger, somebody bringing good news, somebody who is speaking on behalf of God. That's why some believe it to be a human. Some believe it to be a divine being. Some believe it to be Jesus in his pre-incarnate form. All we know is it's some kind of agent or representative. I'm not going to fall on my sword on any of those interpretations. I kind of just believe it was an angel. It was a messenger of God sent on behalf of God to lead the people of God. He's going to guard them. He's going to guide them. He's going to direct them. And what's fascinating about this passage is it says, and you need to obey him. I, I don't believe it's Moses because I, I, the people regularly disobey Moses. They argue with him. They blame him with everything. And, and this has to be more of an impressive being that they're not quite, well, they're not going to disobey him because he represents God. He's a little bit more substantial than Moses, who's just a man. So I don't think it's Moses. I don't think it's Joshua. But this being is to be obeyed. Whoever it is, whatever he is, he's to be obeyed. And notice, God doesn't say, and obey my law. See, he's just given them the Decalogue. He's just given them the 613 laws of the book of the covenant. But he doesn't say, and by the way, obey my law. He says, obey him. And he repeats it. He says, pay careful attention to him. Who? The angel. Whatever he says goes. He's not invalidating the law. They still have to keep the law. But this angel is there to guide and direct them into Help them get to where they need to go. He says, obey his voice. Do not rebel against him. We've seen them rebel against Moses and Aaron, and they're going to do it again. They're not done with that. But he says, do not rebel against him, for my name is in him. This is why some believe him to be the pre-incarnate Christ, that little reference that my name is in him. Really, I think all it's saying is that when when he says, my name is in him, is that he has my authority. He bears my name. He carries my right to tell you what to do. See, God's name is his character. It represents who he is. Um, Names to the the ancient peoples were very important. What you named your kid was important. Um, What you did to your name by your behavior was very important. And so God says, this being, this agent, this messenger bears my name and he carries my full authority. That's why I believe him to be a divine being. He's not just a man. He's someone who can speak on behalf of God and you need to obey him. You need to listen to what he says and you need to do what he says. And if you disobey him, you're basically disobeying me. So you need to listen to him. And God God is basically saying, you can disobey Moses. You can scream at him. You can doubt him, you can ignore him, but you better not disobey this being, this messenger. Because the other thing that goes with this is that he cannot and will not forgive your transgression. One of the things that's interesting about Moses, and I admire about Moses, is that all the times the people bicker and moan against him, he seems to always represent them. He'll go, Lord, Lord, you know, I, I know forgive them. Don't forget they're your people. Don't forget you chose them. And he, and he comes and he intercedes and he begs for God to show them a little bit of grace and mercy. What he says about this being is, he will not forgive you. If you disobey him because he represents me, he will not forgive you. But he will lead you to victory. How? If you do what he says. If you listen to what he says. See, this this divine being, whoever he is, is meant to guide them, protect them, and lead them 
and give them victory in all the battles they're going to fight. That's his mission. That's his goal. We see later on, when my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out. What's God saying? I'm going to lead you into battles that you're going to have to fight, and I'm going to lead you through this angel, through this being. You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. Hey, guys, if you will listen to this divine messenger, this agent of mine, and do what he tells you to do, and don't disobey him, I will bring you victory over who? Everybody living in the promised land, all the Canaanites and Amorites and Hittites, I will take care of them. But you got to listen to what he tells you to do. You got to go into battle when he tells you to go into battle. You can't decide, now's not a good time to fight. We don't feel up to it. We're not ready for it. Give us a couple more weeks. No, you do what he tells you to do. And if you do, he will guide you into victory. And then you have to do what? You have to destroy all the people who live in there. This is the part of the the book of Exodus that we get squeamish about. It's where everybody who doesn't like what we believe attacks our faith and goes, what kind of God would do that? Well, a God who knows human nature, a God who knows that if you don't do this, if you don't destroy the people who live in the land, you will end up marrying with them, you will make treaties with them, and then you will worship their gods and you will walk away from me. And then you will have to face punishment for that. He knows what they will do. You either eradicate the people who live there and do they deserve eradication? Yes, why? Because of sin. They deserve the wrath of God, the punishment of God, because they don't worship God and they have long ago walked away from God. And so he says, you need to eradicate them from the land because the land is being given to you. And if you don't, they will influence you and infect you and you will walk away from me and you will no longer be my light. You will no longer be my treasured possession. You will no longer be a holy people. You will no longer have an influence on the rest of the nations. So you got to utterly overthrow them and break down their pillars. Do not bow down to their gods. See, we want to make all kinds of treaties and alliances with the world. We, we want to kind of cozy up with the world and, and at the same time try to maintain our set-apartness. It's impossible. It's impossible, but we do it all the time. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of compromise, but as soon as you begin to compromise, your convictions get diminished, diluted, and your influence on the world kind of evaporates because now they are influencing you and it's happening all the time. It's happened to the church. It's happened to the church in general where we are beginning to accommodate to the ways of the world. So we have to be really careful just like they had to be careful and they were gonna need to be obedient to this agent. So when they went into the land, they would be obedient to his commands and he would give them victory. But part of the victory was you gotta eliminate so to speak, the competition. You got to get rid of the evil influences that are in the land. He goes on and says, I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand. I'm going to, through this agent, give you victory and I'm going to give you all this land. And he kind of describes the geographic boundaries. And you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land. You will not allow them to stay. You won't make concessions. You won't go, eh, they're a pretty good people. No, no, no. They've got to go. They've got to get out. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. And that snare will end up with your punishment. And we know from the story, right, that ultimately God has to cast them from the land. The scriptures describe the land vomiting them out. I don't know why I can't say that. They, they, the land just regurgitates them. It, it, it's a picture of they make God so nauseous that the land spews them out because they've compromised, because they no longer stand to their convictions. So something significant is going on here, right? God is trying to let these people know that I've sent an angel, this agent, this representative who's gonna guide you, direct you, and lead you into victory. But when he gives you victory, you have to do the rest of what he tells you to do, which is what? Destroy the enemy. Get rid of the enemy. 
So in verse 4, it says, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. What, what's he writing down? He's writing down all the Decalogue, all the Book of the Covenant, everything God has said, everything he's heard from God, he's written down so that he can not only just record it and disseminate it to the people, but it's going to become important to what we see happening in God's description of the tabernacle. So he rises early in the morning. He builds an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Once again, we see Moses acting as the representative of the people and doing things that the people may not necessarily feel led to do, prone to do, want to do. He builds a pillar. It's just like he writes a song and he sings the song and he tries to get them to join him in the singing of God's praises. And now he builds a pillar. Why? Because he wants to commemorate, and, and he wants to seal the covenant that God has give them, given them. So he builds this altar. He's just come from the presence of God. I talked about this a little, a little bit last week. This guy is, is so convinced now of God's reality. Why? Because he's been with him. He's been to the mountaintop. He's heard from God. He's, he's gotten the law from God, the, the, the book of the covenant. He, he's heard from God himself, and so he comes down, and he's so convinced of God's reality that he builds this altar, and he commands that the people pay God the respect that he's due. He's been up there with his brother Aaron and Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. They have actually worshiped God together. God has allowed these men to experience his presence, and also those 70 elders They had a unique, one-of-a-kind, and one-time experience where they got to be with God and live to tell about it. And so they come down, and and, and what he does is he says, guys, we've got to seal this deal. We've got to do what God wants us to do, and we have to, I know you've said we will do it, but now we've got to seal it with a covenant agreement. We've got to make this reality We've got to make sure that we let God know that we're serious about this. And and what's really unique about this is that only Moses of all these individuals, 73 other individuals who got to go up on the mountain, he's the only one who got to enter the cloud and go into God's presence. Now, why is that important? It doesn't tell us anything significant about the holiness, the righteousness of Moses. It really tells us that God is inaccessible unless he allows you into his presence. We know that there's a boundary around the base of the mountain where God says, do not let anyone come near the base because if they touch the mountain while I'm there, they'll die. And when he allows these 73 to go up with Moses, they're only allowed to go so far and only Moses gets to enter the cloud. See, there's, there's some inaccessibility built in. But Moses has been with God. He has felt the presence of God. He has heard God speak to him. And so he's the one who comes down and goes, we've got to build an altar. We've got to do the right thing. So what does he do? He sends young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Now, where did he get this from? I don't think he's just making it up. I don't think he went, well, what do I do now? No, I think he got this from the Lord. God has told him to go down and do this, and he's being obedient, and he does. It's part of the covenant process. Then he took the book of the covenant, those 613 laws, and he reads it in the hearing of the people. Can you imagine if I just sat down right now and read you all those chapters with the 613 laws? Your your eyes would glaze over. You would go to sleep, if not just vacate the room, because that's a lot, right? He just read it to them. Now, why is that significant? Because this is what they just said we will do. This is what they've agreed to do. And he wants them to understand the gravity of what you've just said, the commitment you've just made. And they do it again. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They, they, for the third time, they say, we will do it. So there's no question about God's expectation, right? They, they've read the fine print or he's, had, he's read it to them. And they know what's expected, and they say, we will do it again. We will be obedient. We will do everything that God has said. Do they have any clue what they've just said? No. You know, it's just like my kids. When they were growing up, I would say, okay, here's the deal. This is what you got to do. Yeah, Dad, yeah, we're all over that. And I think they meant it when they were young. When they got to be 16 or 17, they were lying through their teeth. But 
they wanted to do the right thing. They just didn't know that they couldn't do the right thing. They, they had a sin nature. They didn't know that they were going to go against my will. And I think these people meant well, but don't know that how difficult this is going to be. So what does Moses do? He takes this blood and he threw it on the people. Yuck, right? Gross. What's he doing? Again, I think he got this from God. And, and for the first time, we're seeing this reference to blood. Now, we saw blood back when? On the doorpost and the lintel, right? When they sacrificed that one-year-old lamb, unblemished lamb, and then they put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. So we've seen the blood before, but now it's taking on a different form. And God is raising it to an even higher point in the story. Blood's going to become increasingly important as we work through these next chapters. He says, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. He throws the blood on them. Now, one of the things you got to think about, if there's 1.5 to 2 million of them, how in the world did he sprinkle blood on all of them? He probably didn't. He's probably sprinkling the blood on the 70 elders who represent the people who were up on the mountain with him. He's doing it by them vicariously. He's sprinkling it on them because they represent the people. There's no way he had 1.5 to 2 million people parade by him. You know, oh, I just ran out of blood. Get some more. You know, this is not what's going on. So he, but he's sprinkling it on the people. And he says, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. Now, why the blood? What does blood represent? Death. It also represents life, according to the scriptures. But in their minds, blood comes from something just died and they saw it happen. And when they sprinkle the blood, it's a sign of death. It's a sign of, so this happened to you if you don't keep the covenant. And they got it. They, they understood that this is significant. This is basically, if we don't keep our end of the bargain, death is in store for us. There's a penalty for disobedience. There, there's something that's going to happen if you don't obey. And it's a picture of all the things that are going to come with the giving of the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, and all that God is going to expect of them. The covenant was sealed with blood. Again, why, why is this important? Because blood requires death. You don't get blood without death. Now, you can cut yourself and get blood, but that's not the kind of blood we're talking. We're talking about a lot of blood. We're talking about the death of these animals so that enough blood could be used to sprinkle the 70 as representatives of the 1.5 to 2 million. You don't get blood without death. And they have to understand that those animals died, we didn't. We've been spared. Just like in the Passover, right? Their firstborn were spared and didn't have to die because that unblemished one-year-old lamb was killed and its blood got put on the doorpost on lentil. So again, this is this picture that's being represented to them by God that they might understand that what you deserved, you didn't get, and what you got, you didn't deserve. You, you've been passed over yet again. God is making a covenant with you, but you need to be serious about the covenant. You need to obey, and this pattern of the blood is going to carry on through all the rest of the chapters we look at. And we know that blood is significant through the whole Old and New Testament, right? We, we, we understand that Jesus Christ shed his blood for you and I, that Jesus died so we wouldn't have to. He was our sin substitute. He took what we deserved and we got his righteousness and he took on our sin. That's all pictured here. But they didn't understand that, right? They didn't get that, but they did get the whole picture of the blood. Even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people. See, there's this picture of what God is doing, this picture of God's intercession on behalf of the people that I have chosen you as my own and I've set you apart and I've given you this covenant, but you're gonna have to keep the covenant and this covenant comes with consequences for disobedience. See, it's important for us to understand that the, he says, this blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. This is all the way back or, or over in the book of Hebrews, which we're going to study in the spring. This is the author of Hebrews explaining 
writing a commentary on the book of Exodus, helping us to understand what did all this stuff represent? Now, this, this explains for us things that we read and don't quite understand. But remember, the people of Israel living at the time of the Exodus didn't have the book of Hebrews. They didn't have this commentary. They weren't able to look at this and understand these things. And so they were limited in what they could understand. Here's what they knew. God is making a covenant and that co co covenant is sealed with blood and the blood is representative of if we disobey this co covenant, there will be consequences, deadly consequences. We have to obey. Blood confirms their agreement. See, they were really eager three th times to say, we will do, we will do, we will be obedient. Okay, great. Here's what that means. You either obey or you die. You either do what I tell you to do, obey the angel, obey the law, obey the book of the covenant. You do all these things or face death for disobedience. See, now I think it's setting in. Now it's beginning, at, whoa, those were a lot of laws he just read. I, I don't know that I can do all of that. Well, what if I break one of them, two of them, three of them, four of them, 15 of them, 30 of them, 100 of them? What if I don't fully obey everything the angel says, everything God has said? Well, he's just shown you. Disobedience brings death. He expects you to obey. The author of Hebrews goes on and says, in the same way he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. One of the things we have to understand, guys, as we, as we look at the tabernacle, and even as we study about later on the, the temple to come, there was a lot of blood, a whole lot of blood. There's, there's estimates that in the tabernacle and also with the temple, when they, when they sacrificed daily, hundreds, thousands of animals were sacrificed and the priests were literally ankle to calf deep in blood as they made all those sacrifices. That's a lot of blood. And it's really hard to look past a lot of blood. It's really hard to understand the gravity that that was supposed to show the people because the blood represented their own lives if they disobeyed. See, the blood becomes so important in this whole story and, and we, it kind of grosses us out, but we need to understand that, but for the grace of God, go I. We, we can't keep the law any more than they could. We can't live obedient to God any more than they could. And yet we have been spared by what? The blood of Jesus Christ. He shed his blood so that we don't have to. And what this does is it sets up an interesting contrast between Sinai, the mountain, and the tabernacle. And, and I want to just spend a, a few seconds on this to get us to understand there's a transition going on from Sinai to the tabernacle. The tabernacle is going to become more important than the mountain. You know, people have been searching for this mountain for generations. They're still looking for Sinai. Guess what? I don't think they're ever going to find Sinai. Because as soon as we find Sinai, we make an idol out of Sinai. It's, it's the same reason I don't think we're ever going to find the Ark of the Covenant, because if, as soon as we find the Ark of the Covenant, we'll make an idol out of the Ark of the Covenant. Those things are in the past. Those things are no longer where we worship. As a matter of fact, the New Testament tells me that Sinai has been replaced by what? Mount Zion, where Jesus Christ sacrificed his life. The new Jerusalem will be there. See, this whole idea of Sinai, Sinai is important. Sinai is a watershed moment, but there's a big change that takes place. Listen to what it says. Chapter 19, be sure they are ready on the third day, for on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. God will descend on that mountain. That means that mountain's really important at this point in time. It's important for Moses. It's important for Aaron. It's important for the people. And it says, on the morning of the third day, thunder roared, lightning flashed, a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn and all the people trembled. God shows up on Sinai. And what's the result? Fear. Abject fear. They don't want anything to do with that mountain and they don't want anything to do with the God that's appeared on that mountain. They want Moses to go talk to them. They stay far away. They, they stay distant from this God, this deity who they don't, quite understand or know. 
It says, to the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. I think it's an interesting statement. It's a consuming fire. Remember when um, Moses first met, met God back in chapter three? He met him right here at Mount Zion in the form of a burning bush that was not consumed. The bush did not burn up. He knew it was God. And the bush spoke to him and said, take off your sandals because this is holy ground. He knew he was in the presence of God, but now the people see what? A consuming fire. What does that mean? If we get anywhere near, it'll just eat us up. It will burn us alive. See, their picture of God is one dimensional and it produces in them fear. It's a consuming fire. It's not a warming fire. It's not an inviting fire. It's not the fire you put in your fireplace. It's a fire that can literally take your life. See, Sinai for the people of Israel was associated with these things, the law. By now, they're beginning to understand that, that the law is pretty rough. The law is very demanding. It comes with wrath and judgment. See, we sometimes want to revert back to the law. Um, we, I think I talked about this last week. There's probably somebody in the room that wants to get the Ten Commandments put back in all the schools in the nation. I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I just know that that's not going to change anything because all that does is elevate the law and say the law is the key to life. If you obey the law, the world will be a better place. But what do we know? No one can obey the law. All the law can do is show you your sin. So making the law more than it needs to be is something we need to be very careful of because it represents wrath and judgment. The law does not represent grace. We should always be talking about grace and not law. The law represents fear of condemnation and death. See, when they looked, they saw a consuming fire. They didn't see, again, a welcoming, warming place or presence. They didn't want anything to do with that God. The law is also about God's holiness and transcendence. They can't have access to God. See, Sinai is significant, but it also represents God's inaccessibility. God literally put a barrier around it. God literally said, don't come anywhere near it. Don't let any animal touch it. Don't let any person touch it. And only Moses and Nadab and Abihu and Aaron and the 70 elders of Israel can come up and only they can come so far. Only Moses can come into my presence. See, that's about inaccessibility. Nobody got up in the morning and goes, man, I'm going to the top of Mount Sinai and visit the Lord. No, they stayed as far away from that place as they possibly could. God is there, but he's inaccessible. See, look at verses 11 and 12. The Lord will come down on Mount Sinai as the people watch. Mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn the people, be careful. Don't go up on the mountain or even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. Is that inviting? Like, hey, come on, come on to the mountain, come on. No, it's like, stay away. Don't come near. Why? Because you're unholy. You, you are unclean, you, you, you haven't kept my law and you will never keep my law, so you can't come near. But what about the tabernacle? See, the tabernacle's a game changer. They don't realize it yet, but he says, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. This is an incredible statement by God. God is inviting the people to build me a house and I'm gonna come live with you. And we read this and we don't think anything about it. We just blow right past it and go, eh, great. But you got to stop and think, this is the same God who's up on that mountain in the form of fire, thunder, lightning, warning them that if you come anywhere near the mountain, let alone my presence, I will take you out. And now he's saying, hey, build me a house. I'm coming to live with you. I, I want to I live among you. I want to be part of you. I want to bring my presence. And I think at first they go, why would we want to do that? Why would we want him living down here? At least this is safe. Stay up on your mountain, Lord. But no, he goes, no, I want to come live with you. I will live among you. I will not despise you. I will walk among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. What is he telling these people? This is how you've known me so far, but this is who I really want to be to you. I don't want to be the God you fear and run from. I want to be the God who walks among you, lives with you, 
fellowships with you. All these words have to do with fellowship and relationship and closeness and intimacy. It says, then the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. See, God is eventually gonna get them to build this house. He's gonna indwell that house and it's gonna be a place where he lives, but they still can't just willy-nilly just pop into his presence, right? But he's there. He's close. He's right smack dab in the middle of their camp. Remember, they're gonna be at this place, Sinai, for a year, and they're gonna build this tabernacle. They're gonna set it up in the middle of the camp, and they're gonna build all their tents around it, and he's gonna be there with them in their presence, living with them, counseling them, guiding them, directing them from this place called the tabernacle, God's dwelling place. See, he tells them, build this tabernacle this sanctuary, this place of residence. It's sacred, it's holy, it's built for God. It's just a tent, guys. It's estimated that it was no more than probably 45 to 50 feet long and 15 feet wide. Basically four parking spaces in a parking lot. It's not a big place, but it's a significant place. It's God's place. It's God's house. It's where God's gonna live, his dwelling place on earth. Imagine that, that God, the God of the universe, let alone come down to Mount Sinai, would come down and live in their midst with everything he knows about them. See, God knows where this is going. God knows they're gonna be disobedient. God knows they're not gonna keep his law. And yet he says, I'm gonna come live with you. I'm gonna dwell with you. I wanna dwell in your midst. And that word is significant. It means I wanna tabernacle with you. I wanna live among you. I wanna be part of you. See, God has chosen to do that. God chose to live among men, and that should just ring a bell in every guy's mind. What did God do in the incarnation? God took on human form and came to live with you and I. Jesus says that he came to tabernacle with us, live among us, become one of us. See, that's why this is so significant. This holy God requires a holy house. And Jesus Christ was both God and man, 100% God, 100% man. He was a holy man. He was the first and only, the last holy man. He is the only one who could be a proper dwelling place for God because he was fully righteous. So this building couldn't be ordinary. This building couldn't be just another tent that they throw up. It's gotta be unique. So the Lord says, speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you will see from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue and purple and the scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting and for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Now remember, Moses is just getting this. He's just listening. And he's gotta be going, whoa, where are we getting this? How am I supposed to do it? This is a lengthy list. This is an incredible list. And God, God is telling them that you are gonna pay for my house. You're, you're gonna have to make a contribution for my house. If you want me to dwell in your midst, it's gonna cost you. If you want me to be among you, you're gonna have to fund the construction of this house and it's gonna cost you dearly. Remember, this is a lengthy list of very expensive things but he wants them to do it free will of their own accord as the spirit moves you. It's not coerced, you don't have to, I want you to. And we know from later, they're gonna give so willingly that, it, that basically Aaron's gonna go, turn off the tap. We've got more than we need. See, the people are slowly getting it that, that this is worth doing. We want God to live with us. And he had provided them with the means to pull this off. This, this is what's fascinating to me. All the way back in Exodus 12, the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. They asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for, everything. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. This is why God told Moses to tell the people to do this. So that when they get to Sinai and he gives them the designs for the tabernacle, they would have more than enough to dedicate to the building of that building. See, I think they walked out with all that wealth and they thought it was theirs. And in a way it was, because he says, 
look what I've blessed you with. Now are you willing to give it to me to build a house so that I can live in your midst? Are you willing to fund this? The construction of the tabernacle would cost the Israelites dearly. It's estimated that as much as eight tons of gold, silver, and bronze was required to complete it. That's a lot, a lot of money, a lot of wealth, and they had to give it freely. But I want to end with this. This this is the most important part of this morning. He says, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. This thing's literally no bigger than a coffee table, but it's really significant. He says, you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and outside, you shall overlay it. You shall make on it a molding of gold around it. Look at all the references to gold. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet. Two rings on the one side, two rings on the other side. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. You shall put into the ark the testimony, the law, the book of the covenant that I give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end, one cherub on the other. Of one piece of the mercy seat, you shall make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces one to the other. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony I shall give you. This whole thing to me is so confusing. I'm a right brain creative type. I have a degree in graphic design, but I read this and I go, I have no idea what this is going to look like. And if if you built it and I built it, we'd all build something different. But here's what we know. Moses got an exact vision of this from God. He had a mental picture of what it looked like. So he's getting the description, but he knows exactly what the end product needs to look like. And all the stuff about the mercy seat and the cherubim, he knows exactly what it will need to look like. So it's not just this weird description that he's got to somehow figure out and fabricate. It's the ark. And what I want to show you, and this is in your notes, this, this is what jumps out at me. Of all that's in this, these chapters is this one thing is so significant. And I've never really looked at it in this way. So he builds this ark. And in it, he puts the law, the covenant, the book of the covenant. He, he puts in there all these expectations, right? They are in that box. And then he puts a lid on it called the mercy seat. And it's got the cherubim and it's made with gold. And upon that mercy seat will eventually appear the glory of God. He will hover over the mercy seat. It's his throne on earth. And every year, once a year on the day of atonement, blood has to be sprinkled on that mercy seat. An animal has to be sacrificed, an un, unblemished animal, and blood will go on that mercy seat in order that the people might receive what? Forgiveness. And so that they might receive justification, that they might be made right with God. You got to understand, guys, what's going on here. Remember, what's in the box? The law. This is why we don't make a lot about the law because the law can only show us our sin. The law can't make us righteous. The law can't make me holy. It can only show me how unholy I am and how much I need God. So the law is unkeepable. It's unobeyable. Yeah, you can do it in bits and pieces, but you will never keep all the law and neither would they. His covenant is unattainable. You'll never fully fulfill the requirements of the covenant. The mercy seat is undeservable. Think about this. God gives them the law and then covers it with his mercy. That's the picture here. Law, mercy. Undeserved, unattainable, unachievable, undeservable. And then he shows his glory. And it's still unapproachable, right? His glory appears in there and even Moses can't go in. Only the high priest one time a year could go into the presence of God. His glory is still unapproachable and his judgment is what? Unavoidable. Judgment for what? Sin. There's mercy, but there's gotta be blood. There's gotta be payment. 
in order to get achievement because without the blood, God's favor is unachievable. You'll never achieve favor with God without going through Christ. That's the way it works. And our restor restoration is unfathomable. It's unbelievable what God has done. See, God told Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. This incredible promise from God would not have escaped them. And in their minds, God occupied, occupied a distant and unapproachable place called heaven. But now he's coming to earth. For this transcendent, all-powerful God to offer to dwell in their midst was not something they took lightly. And the design of the tab tabernacle was meant to reflect the glory of heaven coming to earth. See, that's what's so significant about this moment, but it's also significant about the moment we will celebrate a few months from now, the coming of Christ to earth, the incarnation, the birth of Jesus. John says, the word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as, the only, as of the only son from the father, full of what? Grace and truth. Paul writes in Corinthians, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you? We are the temple. This is where he's chosen to live. I don't get it. I wouldn't live here. I, I wouldn't want to come dwell in you, but he has and he's dwelled in me. And together we are the temple of God on earth. So why is this significant? Why, why is it significant for them? Because the holy God of the universe, the God who has to punish all sin and knows these people will be sinful, even though they're set apart, is gonna provide them what, with what? Mercy. And it's gonna go on for him to give them the law because the, the law and then the sacrificial system go hand in hand. They'll never keep the law. And so he gives them the sacrificial system so that they might be able to be made right with him. But it's only partial and we've been the beneficiaries of the full payment for sin through Jesus Christ. So here's your first question. What are some things that we do that reveal our lack of belief that God has come to dwell in us and among us? See, I've had to think about this this week, that God literally dwells in me in the form of his Holy Spirit, and I take it for granted every stinking day. That the God of the universe, the holy, righteous, sinless, omnipotent, all-powerful God has chosen to dwell within me why do I show and how do I show my lack of belief in that reality? And how do you do it? Secondly, go back and look at the chart, our beautiful God. Why is the sequence and the design so important? And what does it teach us about God's glory? Notice the way it all lays out and why is that important? Finally, read Hebrews 15, 26 through 29. It's on the very front page of your handout. Why should we revere God's glory but not fear his wrath? And why should this give us hope? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to study it as men. And we pray that you would guide our conversations around the tables, that we would see and hear and speak the things that we, you would have us to. And that, Father, we would walk out of here understanding the incredible nature and reality that you, the God of the universe, has come to dwell with us. And may we live like it, reflect it, believe it, and may it show up in every area of our lives today. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.